This is CBC Here and Now. This is what our tenants left. Picking up the pieces in a trashed St. John's home. Oh my God, look dad, there's nothing but needles right here. His friend broke into his home, he shot him. They weren't invited in, they came in and uh, they invaded his house that night. He faced a murder charge, but now that's dropped. A moose couldn't stop him, but the cops eventually did. We'll tell you how far he got. Well, some flurries in the mix tonight, but we're clearing out for Friday. Temperatures warming, but the clouds and showers will move back in through Saturday. The details ahead. Well, a St. John's landlord is in shock tonight. Nicole Ivy Cross says it took too long to get bad tenants out of her home. And now she's left with dirty needles and thousands of dollars in damage. Here now's Arianna Kelland reports. Cole Ivy Cross was relieved when her upstairs tenants finally got out this weekend. That was until she got inside. This is what our tenants left. For us. About 200 needles on the floor, blood on the walls, garbage just about everywhere. Oh my God, look dad, there's nothing but needles right here. Oh, yeah. oh, whack them. In the middle, children's clothing and stuffed animals. These little teddy bears and stuff, I hope they didn't have a kid in here. Downstairs, things weren't looking much better. Those tenants had left the week before. They damaged the property and were given 10 days to fix it. Ivy Cross says when they went inside with a police escort, they realized the damage wasn't only still there, it was made worse. They ended up leaving without paying rent. She estimates it will cost around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to repair the damage, leaving questions about their rights to kick out the tenants at the first sign of trouble. The rights of tenants and landlords are supposed to be protected by the Provincial Residential Tenancies Act. The Tory government finished a review of the system in 2012, but it was shelved. The minister responsible, Sherry Gambin Walsh, declined an on-camera interview, but in a statement said the department intends on building on the work that's already been done and is, quote, committed to reviewing the legislation, leaving some landlords wondering, is it worth the rental risk? Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Well, one person who knows a lot about that rental risk is property manager Lindsay Kelly. I spoke with her about the ordeal some landlords have to go through when they have trouble tenants and what kind of changes she'd like government to make. I've seen uh, needles and drug paraphernalia as well. Um, we've also seen um, apartments just um, vandalized. So we went into one place and there was the cupboards full of food and ketchup and mustard all over the walls and the ceilings and the, the washing machine and the dryer just full of garbage and spray paint and, you know, <laughs> It's a mess. When you have a tenant who's being so blatantly destructive and the landlord can see it, they know it, why can't a landlord just go in there and kick them out? Yeah, um, there's a whole bunch of procedures that you have to, to follow. There's a Residential Tenancies Act and that spells out processes that have to be taken um, and steps that you have to go through legally uh, before you can actually get them removed from the property physically. Mm -hmm. So if you could play puppeteer to government, what would you change with the Residential Tendencies Act? Those appeal processes need to be need to be cut down for sure. And there needs to be more different types of evidence um, that they're willing to accept. Complaints from neighbors, um, evidence from the landlords, not just someone else living, living in the building. Um, not only does the act not protect landlords, Often it doesn't protect the tenant either, right? You've got a good tenant there who doesn't feel comfortable living there, living with someone who's really causing them stress, disrupting their, their quality of life. And they're the ones who have to show up at court and testify against that person, knowing it could take another three months before they actually move and you've got to live in the same property then with them. You know, once they know that you're evicting them, they're not treating the property with any care, if they were to begin with. Um, you know, they're really just trashing it usually. Plus, once you issue an eviction notice, they usually stop paying you rent. Mm -hmm. So you've got the expense and you've got lost income during that entire process that it takes to get them out. 
Yeah. And what would be a reasonable uh, time frame to give uh, landlords to, to get tenants out of? Three months is too long. What would be a more reasonable time frame? What more power should landlords get? Um, I think you, you need to have a month max. If they're, if it's someone who is causing extreme damage, who's causing disturbances in the neighborhood to other tenants, you know, a month is more than enough time to for them to find somewhere else to live. And what do you do when they just won't leave, though? Well, that all adds to the process. So you eventually have to take it down to the sheriff's office, and the sheriff's office will have to physically remove them. But again, once it gets down there, they give them so much longer to get out before they can actually physically go remove them and change the locks. Well, we're not finished with this story yet. Coming up in about 35 minutes, here and now we'll bring you inside the house that's renewing the debate about the rights of people who rent. Arianna Kelland will be live with the landlords to talk about their concerns and the challenges they faced getting their tenants out. When Labrador City's fire chief got a call from Switzerland yesterday, he thought it was a prank. That's because the person on the other end said a hot air balloon was making an emergency landing in the woods near Lorraine Lake. Turns out the balloon was competing in an annual long distance race, part of the world's biggest hot air balloon festival in Albuquerque, New Mexico. After 60 hours and more than 3,600 kilometers, the two men manning the balloon broke a world record. This is a, a very small basket, competition basket, less than one square meter. This is very small. And uh, one pilot tried to, uh, to sleep and the another one uh, is in command to try to uh, avoid air traffic control or the airplane and to continue the flight. It's very amazing to, to start in the desert uh, of the New Mexico, uh, in the New Mexico area, and to finish here uh, in Labrador City. We have uh, quite a lot of snow this morning in uh, Labrador City, so it's uh, really a huge, uh, a huge trip. Some view. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, and despite breaking a world record for distance, the Swiss balloonists say there's no prize, just bragging rights among gas ballooners across the globe. Now the pilots, apparently they weren't hurt during the landing. They're staying at a hotel in Lab City and are working to get their balloon and gear out of the woods. Now that's an adventure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and he mentioned the snow in Labrador City and we had a taste uh, with some pictures coming in from you. It was snow for not only the folks in the balloons, but the folks heading to school as well. And Carrie Rose sent this picture in of the snowy start in Lab West this morning. And we've had some flurries on the go through much of the day in through Labrador. And we're actually seeing a few flurries mixing in over the west coast of the island, as well as some grapple of some of those snow pellets mixing in again, especially in along the west coast. But even here down the northeast coast, we've had some that grapple mixing in through the metro region as well. Look at the radar. Lots of activity. If you are heading out over the next couple of hours, make sure you grab the umbrella because one minute it's dry. The next minute you're getting into one of these steady downpours. Things taper off through the overnight tonight with that risk of a flurry even in the northeast. Uh, as we roll into the Friday morning time period, though, we're clearing out quite nicely. And in fact, uh, Friday shaping up to be a pretty nice day. Note those home time temperatures are a little bit warmer, still in the high single low double digits, but overall pretty nice Friday shaping up. Very cold for a start for some. We'll talk more about this with your detailed Friday and weekend forecast in just a few minutes. Debbie. Tomorrow on Here and Now, a dreadful anniversary. 75 years ago, a German U-boat fired a torpedo into the SS Caribou. She sank in a flash southwest of Port of Basque. 137 lives lost. When you look back at that day in your life, was that the saddest day? I thought it was the sad story, yeah. Couldn't be much worse. A feature interview with the only known survivor of the sinking of the caribou. Meet 99-year-old Hedley Lake tomorrow on Here and Now. Well, a Botwood homeowner who police say killed an intruder will not go to trial. A second-degree murder charge against Gilbert Budgel was dropped today. Police alleged Budgel killed a masked man who broke into his home in April of 2016. The RCMP say Budgel shot and beat the man who later died in hospital. In court this morning in Grand Falls, Windsor, the Crown said there wasn't a strong enough case to convict 
Budgel. So charges were dropped. Budgel's lawyer says his client is still shaken by what happened. The client has always expressed remorse about what happened. There's, there's one, ever since I first met him, he's been saying, you know, uh, how sorry he was with respect to this uh, incident, how uh, he did not understand why a person who was a friend uh, had uh, come into his house, and he wished things had turned out uh, much more differently. There are more details tonight about what the shutdown of Sears stores means for this province. The company went into creditor protection in June with plans to close 59 stores across the country, including the ones in Cornerbrook and St. John's. On Tuesday, after a potential buyer fell through, Sears indicated it will seek court approval to sell off all remaining assets, a move that will eliminate 190 jobs in Newfoundland and Labrador. It's that time of the year again, time for a flu shot. This year's vaccine will be available across the province starting Monday, October 23rd. All four health authorities will be setting up clinics where people can get the needle. The flu shots will also still be available free of charge as part of a visit to the doctor. They're also free at pharmacies for anyone who is part of the province's drug program. Well, how do you get a damaged double-decker plane back up in the air? Crews investigating a French Airbus forced to land in Happy Valley Goose Bay may have the answer. One of the plane's four engines exploded over Greenland while traveling from Paris to Los Angeles late last month. More than 500 passengers and crew were on board at the time. French investigators are now working to repatriate the jet, but first, part of the broken engine has to be removed from the wing. A second engine will then be mounted in its place for weight. In the meantime, the Airbus is sitting at the Goose Bay Airport. This smashed up vehicle is part of a strange story from the Buren Peninsula Highway today. The RCMP say the driver struck a muse, moose just south of Swift Current. Now he wasn't hurt, but he did need help from other motorists to get the animal off his car. Then with the windshield badly damaged and the driver's side glass barely intact, the man carried on towards St. John's. He made it 170 kilometers before the Holyrood RCMP stopped him and convinced him to call a tow truck. Condo owners at the Sindera condominium complex in St. John's now have a clearer picture of what will happen to the building. We'll have an explanation next.
see what it's like to live in Canada's tiniest town, Tilt Cove, population four. Our season debut, Sunday at 12.30 and Monday at 7. Welcome back to Here and Now. The Newfoundland and Labrador Credit Union has told condo owners at the Sundera that it plans to sell off the 33 vacant units in the building as a single block. At an information session last night, the credit union outlined plans to seek bids on the units and a large parcel of land next to Sundera where Rockmount Properties planned to build three similar buildings. Fred Hutton has that story. After months of uncertainty, the 12 people who did buy condos in the 45-unit complex were given new information about the future of the building. The credit union says that over the next three weeks, it will call for bids for the unsold condos and the adjacent land. The news did not go over well with many of the owners who did not want to speak about the matter on camera out of fear that the negative publicity will further diminish the value of their property. Beverly Leahy and Judy Johnson have already lost thousands of dollars maintaining their deceased brother's condo and they know they will lose thousands more before they can sell it. Basically it was what I expected them. It was the credit union telling us how they're going to approach selling the building and recouping their investment in it. It had very little to do with the personal condos that the other people that people own here. According to people who were at last night's meeting, credit union officials told them that they did not foreclose on Rockmount properties and that the company is not in receivership. Of course, Rockmount is partially owned by Premier Dwight Ball. CBC News tried to contact someone from the credit union. Our calls were not returned. Privately, condo owners are questioning how the entire matter has been handled and wonder if the Premier's stake in the company is influencing any of the decisions. Last week, the Premier issued a statement saying that his business holdings are now in a blind trust. He said, prior to the establishment of the blind trust, as a minority shareholder, I can say that I met or exceeded any of the commitments and obligations required by me. Documents obtained by CBC News show that in 2014, Dwight Ball disclosed to the House of Assembly that he held a 33% stake in Rockmount Properties. But in 2016, after he was elected Premier and set up the Blind Trust, the disclosure documents show that in addition to his 33% preferred shares, his family trust also held 33% ownership of common shares in Rockmount. I think we're, our hands are tied right now. Fact. Judy Johnson and Beverly Leahy know they can't sell now because of the uncertainty surrounding the building. They plan to hold off until the spring. My biggest fear is if they sell the units as a block or the new owners or whatever puts them on the market, uh, they can probably sell them for 150000 Fred Hutton, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the second season of the TV series Frontier is set to debut next week on the Discovery Channel. You don't start a war to kill one man. What you call war, they call business. A coin for blood is bent in its way. We can fight them without becoming them, so can I. It's our goal to rebuild the Black Wolf or undermine the company. I want both. Don't touch me! Man, has been taken into custody. He's on a ship. Down for London. Captain Chesterfield, this fort will need an acting governor until Lord Fisher completes his inquiry. Well, the historic drama is set in the 1700s during the early days of Canada's fur trade and stars actor Jason Momoa of Game of Thrones and Aquaman fame and our very own Alan Hocko. Much of Frontier is shot in Newfoundland and is a project of Alan's Take the Shot Productions in partnership with Netflix. And as you can see, I have slipped out of the Here and Now studio to be here in uh, Studio F. And Alan is here with me. It's great to have you. It's lovely to be here. It's <laughs> always lovely to be here. <laughs> now, uh, the show, it's been picked up for a third season. The second one hasn't even aired yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I, how does that work? Uh, don't they wait for ratings anymore these days? I don't know. <laughs> I think Rob and Peter Blackie are very smart and tricky. I think they've tricked them in t t convincing them that they're a year behind or something. I'm not sure what they do, but we're <laughs> always very grateful. And Netflix is going to carry the uh, series in Canada this year? Yeah, so Nef it, it, season one is on Netflix now. So the deal we have with Discovery, Discovery is our Canadian broadcaster, but in America and to the rest of the world, it's a Netflix original. 
So there's some windowing issues about when it can be on Netflix in Canada. Mm -hmm. So uh, season two will be on Discovery this Wednesday on the 18th. And then it'll be on Crave for a while, but season one is on Netflix. It's so hard to explain that to your cousins. <laughs> well, I thought it was on Netflix. <laughs> well, no, it is on Netflix, but it's not on Netflix. Ah, never mind. <laughs> They'll find it. Yeah. They'll find it. Yeah, yeah. Now, I want to go back to season one. Uh, the reviews were mixed. Uh, there were some negative reviews, uh, but there's a lot of fans of this series. So I'm just wondering when you... Uh, went in to make uh, season two, how did that inform the way you dealt with with the show? I honestly, and this is the honest to God truth, I never read reviews <laughs> be because uh, I'm a come from the theater. Yeah. And if you read a review while you're in live production of a play, it can completely devastate you, good or bad. <laughs> if it's good, then you get too high in yourself and you lose the momentum of what you're doing. And if it's bad, you c I had one production of a play once where it had like negative stars. It was production of Romeo and Juliet. And it destroyed the whole cast. Mm -hmm. So I have a policy of not reading them. And I don't know if uh, from, you know, Rob, uh, Perry Chafe, Rob Blackie, Peter Blackie uh, were involved in writing the first season with some other writers. And the Blackies are the showrunners and the creators. And they're, they're responsible for season two with some other writers. I know there's a lot of cooks and there's a lot of input. There's two broadcasters. There's Netflix, you know, that's one set of notes. And then they have Discovery. It's their show here. So I think that combined, they just focus on what they want to do and what's best. I don't think there's a lot of listening to uh, critics. Although it's the New York Times loved it and, yeah. <laughs> and compared our show to Taboo. You know that series Taboo? Yes, yeah. And there was a lot of comparisons saying that Frontier was much better. <laughs> well, there is a season three. That's the important That's thing. That's right, yeah. Uh, you're going to start shooting in Newfoundland. You're shooting during the winter. That must be a challenge. And y your actors are in period costumes yourself. Like, yeah. do you wear high tech long johns or something? <laughs> we do. We uh, I discovered, and I wish I had them as a kid skating on ponds, uh, heated long johns. Really? Uh, they're the, you spend a lot of time, in, I know, in the woods and stuff. <laughs> it's the greatest invention. And I used them on production of Cot when it wasn't even cold. I just was like, why, why, why wouldn't I have heated long johns? We'll have to talk afterwards. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Um, I did hear you say uh, earlier today that season three, oh no, season two, which we're going to start looking at next week, is a whole lot sexier. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I did say that. <laughs> there it is. Uh, yes, it, it, there is. Um, well, the the warmth thing. My character is almost never outdoors, mm. but uh, you know, Vatcher and the Blackies are all out there with Jason in the wilderness. So I never have that. And but uh, it's the kind of thing that I never thought my character would have to venture into any kind of. Um, I didn't think Douglas Brown was ever going to be destined for any kind of romantic. Stuff. This is your Scottish trader. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, the you know the 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 bookworm intellectual uh, guy trying to keep all the barbarians from killing him at all times, uh, and uh, yeah, there's some turns in 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 store for Douglas that I was not <laughs> anticipating. And I don't write the show. <laughs> I do not write. It. I'm not a part of the creative process, and uh, because there's so many cooks in that kitchen, and Brad Payton from Gander is like an executive producer. Uh, you know, Momo Momoa himself is an exec. So I know you have to work on a Scottish accent. Uh, yeah. So there's going to be some interesting lines that you're going to have to rehearse by the sounds of it. <laughs> yeah. There, uh, you know how I learn my, my work with a dialect coach in the UK over Skype almost every day? And then I listen to Rebus, Ian Rankin's uh, books on tape. They're nar his narrator is in the same play region of Scotland that Douglas is from. And I walk my dogs around the lake. and. If you've seen me out there talking to myself with my dogs, I'm learning my Scottish accent. Can you accent. give us a line? Uh, <laughs> it's been a, it's been a while, <laughs> I, but I, it's, it's like it's stays with you a wee bit. But <laughs> thanks so much, Alan. Thank you. That's great. And just remind us when and what time next uh, Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday, the 18th of October, Discovery Canada season two. I think it's on at 11:30 p.m., but you can tape it or PVR, and season one is available right now on Netflix and on Crave, so catch up on season one and have fun. It's a, season two is such an excellent season of television. Alan Hawko, thank you. Thank you. Well, up next, we take you to a small beach in Ships Cove, Placentia Bay, to explain why crews are trying to restore the area.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Well, Ryan, I think my favorite word that you've been using lately is uh, grapple. Yep. But uh, we are grappling with <laughs> what that exactly is because it's not a common word that we I never really heard it use. before you started using it. Yeah. I don't think. And I again, we only usually, I only usually use it this time of year because this is typically when we see it in the mm -hmm. fall season. And yeah, a few people uh, giving me credit, they've been using it to win Scrabble games uh, this week. <laughs> uh, again, it is a relatively uh, uncommon word and an uncommon type of pre that we see certainly the least common of all the wintry precept but I thought I'd give a little explainer because a few people have been asking what is it well here is a look at uh, what it looks like and, and that's how you spell it that's how you spell it so <laughs> grapple is also known as snow pellets uh, but uh, technically uh, it is known as grapple and in terms of all of the different types of precip well here's how it differs from hail and freezing rain and ice pellets. So let's break it down one by one here. Hail, for, only thing to know about hail is that it only happens with thunderstorms. And so uh, ice particles stay up there, they grow so heavy that the cloud can't support it anymore and then back down they come as hail. Grapple starts as snow, it falls into a super cooled layer of water, gets a little thin layer of ice on it, and it falls yes as grapple and it's kind of you can crush it with your with your fingers freezing rain snow that falls into a warm layer it stays as rain all the way until it hits your car and then you got to scrape it off and then of course ice pellets well that's where it falls through a warm layer completely melts back into a cold layer that's deep enough that it refreezes and it falls as ice pellets so a little bit of everything uh, to show you there but Again, hail only in thunderstorms. And I know uh, Teddy Dillon, our cameraman here, said in Newfoundland, everything's hail, Ryan. Everything's hail. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it, te technically, uh, those are how we would uh, classify our different wintry precepts. But yeah, uh, hail, right? Now you know. Now you know. Uh, current temperatures right now, four degrees in uh, Corner Brook, just two in Labrador City. And again, it's been that northwest wind that has been a little on the breezy side, uh, especially along parts of the coast today. And with that cold air coming in the loft, this is where we've been seeing, yes, the grapple and the wet flurries over western Newfoundland in particular today. Stephenville, Corner Brook, Gross Morn, uh, higher elevations of Gross Morn certainly seeing some of those wet flurries in the east. Again, lots of action here. Scattered showers at times heavy, and it's in those heaviest downpours where we often see that grapple getting right down to the surface. You can see in the reds and oranges here, this is where we're seeing some of those really steadier showers. Uh, great tweet from somebody today that said they had the clothes out on the line. The clothes dried and got wet eight or nine times uh, today. And uh, yeah, definitely want to bring them in because they're not going to dry uh, over this evening as we still see those showers moving through uh, with that risk of grapple and even some wet flurries not out of the question. Area of high pressure moves in to clear us out on Friday. Our next system will be moving in through the day on Saturday. And here's how it plays out. Note the, even the model picking up on uh, some of that wintry precip uh, in the mix tonight along the northeast coast into Metro. By the time we get to Friday morning, bit of clouds still lingering along the northeast coast, including St. John's. And then we're looking at the clouds building in into the afternoon with some showers into the late afternoon for Labrador City, increasing clouds for the rest of the big land. And it's sun and cloud and a beautiful uh, Friday afternoon and even into early Saturday shaping up on the island. Our next system, as I mentioned, will build in from west to east through the day on Saturday. Looks like we'll start to see some of those showers uh, as we move into the later parts of, uh, of the morning for the west coast, afternoon for central and late day here in the east. We'll break down Saturday's details uh, in complete uh, detail coming up in just a few minutes. How about Labrador City? Minus five tomorrow morning, so a hard freeze there. In fact, most of Labrador will be below freezing. Low-lying areas of central will dip below freezing as well. We're talking about temps near and just above freezing even in metro, uh, likely near two degrees to start the day tomorrow. Winds in from the northwest, so once again, eight, nine degrees. Clouds dominate early on, more sun into the afternoon. As as that area of high pressure sets up overhead. Likely some double digits along the south coast tomorrow, uh, shielded from that onshore west northwest flow. And yeah, just five, six degrees along the coast of Labrador. And there's that risk of some afternoon showers in the west. Weekend in full detail, and we'll talk about an interesting system moving in for Sunday night into Monday with significant snow possible for parts of Labrador. The details on that coming up, Carolyn.
Thanks, Ryan. Well, we go to Ship Cove now in Placentia Bay. That's where a small beach is getting a makeover, all in an effort to bring back spawning Capelin. When I was going to school here, there was 27 of us at school. And uh, when we get out at for recess, everybody came to this beach. We'd all have a little bucket, you know, two people to a bucket, and we'd come down here collecting Capelin at recess time bring them up and put them in the brooks and I mean, 20 minutes later they died, they died in the fresh water. Well, we still have the remnants of a, of a capelin spawning stock here, but uh, nothing like they used to. There's about one tenth of what used to come here, yeah. comes here now. And it's mainly because of the, the, the loss of the, this, this habitat. Hopefully we're fixing it. Well, the uh, federal government has uh, supported the recovery of the, the Capelin through uh, Coastal Restoration Fund to rebuild Capelin habitat. We're here in Ship Cove because probably about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, this beach was dug out, uh, I think, to, to help build a new road. And what it meant was the Capelin habitat disappeared. So they don't roll here nearly in the numbers they used to. So what we're doing is starting a project to rebuild that habitat so we can see the Capelin roll again. Mostly because of the loss of the habitat. We've lost probably 90% of what Capelin that used to spawn here. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll regain it. We're hoping to have, when we get started, maybe three trucks, three heavy haul trucks, and the excavator, and another excavator somewhere else so where they really collect the, the fill and, uh, and the armor stone from, and uh, I, I yeah, have Put it back in there. Right? Yeah, 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 hopefully we start up there. You put a big emphasis on that, so the engineers told me yesterday that you, you've got to stop that erosion that's, right. that's starting. Well, the work will start fairly soon and happen throughout the winter months and we will come back next year and the test will be uh, when the Cape One roll next year to see uh, whether we've been successful. But we're very hopeful that the work that we do to restore this beach um, will bring the Cape One back here to spawn. Well, we have new video to show you tonight of a model of the Avro Aero fighter plane. It was found using technology from this province. Divers in Lake Ontario have inspected the model and confirmed it is a scale version of the fighter jet that Canada scrapped in the 1960s. It was found using an underwater robot operated by Kraken sonar. The models were originally used to test the aerodynamics of the plane. The hope is to recover all the models and turn them over to a museum. Blood splattered ceilings, broken cupboard doors, and so much more. This is a landlord's horror story. And coming up, we'll speak with one of the people who has to clean this all up.
welcome back. Earlier on Here and Now, we showed a landlord's biggest nightmare. Nicole Ivy Cross and her husband were left to clean up a big mess after tenants in both their top and bottom apartments moved out. Here and Now's Ariana Kelland is with the landlords inside their rental property tonight. Ariana? Thanks, Carolyn. Well, I am with Matthew Cross, one of the two landlords. And uh, Matthew has been landlord for years, but has never come in contact with what happened in this top floor and bottom floor apartment. So can you first tell us where we are and give us an idea of what this looked like 48 hours ago? Well, right now we're in the living room. So basically, it's been quite the ordeal to get these uh, tenants out. And since we got back in the apartment now two days ago, I mean, the whole area was covered in garbage and, and, and needles and, and, you know, drug paraphernalia and the like. So we've been left with mess of, I mean, flooring is beyond repair. There's been clear damage done with uh, hammers and other, you know, stuff. We've gotten anywhere from what appears to be blood on our ceilings. We've had to encounter, there was upwards to a thousand fruit flies in the apartment. So we've had to put fly traps in every room. I mean, we've, it's just beyond what any little damage deposit at, you know, is given to the landlord at the start of a term would cover this type of cost. So, I mean, we've certainly gone through our share of damages here. Can you talk about the challenges with getting problem tenants out? How long did it take from the moment that you spotted th there being a problem to the moment that they left? Well, it started some time ago. We, we, we were trying to get the tenants out for some time. We gave you know, several eviction notices. We've been going back and forth through the tenants board. Uh, we've dealt with the RNC. We, it's, there's always seems to be a gray area. Everyone wants to help, but it, we keep getting pushed on to another department, another person. You need to contact this person. So there, there's certainly a large gray area in the matter, and we're trying to figure out. I mean, there has to be, it has to be cut and dry in terms of who can help you because it seems like the system is made for tenants and, and not landlords. So something certainly has to be done to improve this. Yeah, and you had mentioned that it's a challenge even knowing, like, at what point does this become criminal when you have tens of thousands of dollars worth of damage? Can you talk about how challenging it was figuring out who to call and, um, you know, who to go to next and how to solve this problem? Well, certainly, I mean, everyone, everyone was very friendly. But in terms of actually getting help, everyone wants to help, but they say that, you know, like we need to contact when we talked about the damages, because we've had, we're guessing, ten to $15,000 worth of damage. So they say, we go to the tenants board to discuss this. They try and put in a claim. They say, this is malicious damage. You need to talk to the RNC. So we go to the RNC, and then we hear, no, this is a civil matter. You need to go to the tenants board. So we just keep circling and circling, and we get nowhere. And in terms of getting a resolution to this, we're not getting nowhere. And as well, we're, you know, the tenants are here that much longer and we're doing that much more damage to my apartment here. So there has to be something in place. And based on uh, you going through the system, is there anything that you can see that would make it simpler for people like you and your wife? Well, certainly there just has to be, it has to be known or, or the help has to be readily available to point you in the, the correct direction, where to go, who to speak to, or what the correct process is. I mean, the people we talk to, they're certainly knowledgeable on the system as it is right now. It's just that the system is, there's flaws, there's loopholes. I mean, a tenant could go months and, and not pay rent, do damages, and they still walk out at the end of the day and not have to pay a cent. So there has to be something in place there in terms of who to go to or, or what the process is. So. And uh, really quickly, what, what's going to happen now with, with your two apartments? What do you plan on doing? Well, once we get all the damages done now, we'll have to assess. I mean, this obviously, this we've gone through two apartments, actually, in the last month now. So this has set us back our, you know, I mean, this is just a little bit of additional income to us. This is not a full-time gig for me. So, I mean, we'll have to sit down and see how much this expenses costs and where we go from there. So, Thank you very much. Thank you. That was uh, Matthew Cross. Debbie? Thanks very much. That's our Ariana Kellen reporting for us live tonight on a very troubling story indeed. Well, kids enjoy getting on the ice to play hockey, but when you're blind, it can be a challenge. Now one person is bringing together people with visual impairments to play hockey. As here now as Peter Cowan found out, he wants to make it a regular thing. My name is Steve Joy uh, from Kellegrew's uh, Concession Bay South. Uh, 
been involved with hockey for the last 35 years. And uh, today I'm trying to bring basically Newfoundland or bring Canadian blind hockey to Newfoundland for the kids that are out there or adults that would like to play the, the game and never had the opportunity to do it. Uh, a lot of times people don't understand, like they say, well, blind hockey? How, do, how does somebody blind play hockey? Uh, and to be quite honest, um, first time I heard about blind hockey, I felt the same way. I went away to a, a program in Vancouver uh, this past summer uh, where uh, I participated in, in, a, in a program and it was, uh, it was, it was fantastic just to, to be able to see. I mean, there's people on the ice 100% blind and they're playing hockey. Well, imagine taking like toilet paper tubes and looking through those. So it's basically I have no peripheral vision or losing it. Yeah. And so how does that affect your ability to play hockey? So like from far distance I can see stuff, but like as soon as it gets closer, I can't really see it at all. So it definitely affects like if the puck's like right by my feet. Some people, normal, like people with normal vision would be able to see it, but I wouldn't be able to at all. The puck is a, is a, larger, uh, a larger puck. It's made out of metal has bearings inside of it, um, you know, and that's obviously for uh, audible so, so that people can hear it. What do you enjoy most about playing the sport? That I get to travel and meet a lot more people that had vision impaired, got the same problem that I got and like that kind of stuff. Well, I would say like before, like, uh, like I wasn't able to because like I was scared that, uh, that I would be too outclassed because of my visual impairment, but uh, now it kind of like feels like we're on even playing grounds now. So, uh, you know, it feels a lot better like this to try it now. Time to meet our young athlete of the day. This is Zoe Blair of St. John. Zoe is 10 years old and recently learned all about roller derby at her first session with the 709 Junior League. Zoe loves to be the jammer on the team and is looking forward to the next session this fall. Awesome job, Zoe. You're today's young athlete of the day. Roller derby. Cool. derby. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I, definitely. Yeah, I don't know if we've had a young athlete doing roller derby. I think that's and the first one. Yeah. She loves being the jammer. That's a whole new language. Totally. I, 
going to have to investigate uh, that. I'm going to try it. For sure. <laughs> I'm going to try it. <laughs> Uh, okay, so cool temps. I mean, the big theme the last couple of days. We're warming towards uh, as we move into the weekend, but moving in the clouds and showers, of course, as well. Mm -hmm. Always comes with a price tag uh, this time of year. Have a look at uh, eastern Canada, and you can see where temps are into the teens. 14, 15 degrees. I'm not sure we'll get that warm, but certainly 13 to 12 degrees, not out of the question, Saturday into Sunday. Uh, kicking out those cool single digit temps that we have in place right now. The weather setup, yeah, it's a northwest flow, which is keeping in those cool temps right now, keeping us in those cool temps. Area of high pressure will move in overhead for Friday, clearing us out, but our next system is moving quickly in behind and will increase the clouds and the showers as we move into the Saturday time period. So there's Friday morning, some lingering showers uh, just offshore, but I think we will be dry for St. John's in the northeast coast. Certainly the cloud cover lingering through the morning hours, more sun into the afternoon in Labrador, clouds building in through the afternoon. Watch for a late day shower in the west. Temperatures are going to be in that 7, 8, degree range for most of Labrador. We're in the 8 to 10 degree range across the island. Northwest winds so will be warmest along the south coast. Now watch your timeline here as we roll through a Friday night into Saturday. Those showers moving through Labrador for Newfoundland. Showers approach through the morning for the west coast through the afternoon for central. And I think it's an evening risk for the Buren and the Avalon Peninsulas, where most of Saturday will be dry. Even some sunshine early on. Temperatures will warm to 12 degrees. Do keep an eye uh, for those showers into the evening if you do have some Saturday evening plans. Temperatures cooling in Lab West with some flurries mixing in, certainly by Saturday night. Uh, clearing out briefly and have a look. Sunday morning, not bad. Some sunshine, clouds build in through the afternoon, and that's the name of the game across the island. In Labrador, we've got snow by late Sunday afternoon into western parts of Labrador. Sunday evening for Happy Valley Goose Bay, and that is on the leading edge of our next system, which will be an interesting one. Details on that in just a second. There are double digits across the most of Newfoundland, at least on Sunday. Uh, just one in Labrador City and yeah, low single digits for most of Labrador. So watch the setup with this next system. Cold air on the on the leading edge of this system. So it does look like we'll see snow mixing to rain. Happy Valley Goose Bay in the southeast. But for northern Labrador, back across Churchill Falls, Labrador City, this may, may be a mostly snow event and could see Based on this projection and some of the others out there, uh, some significant snowfall possible uh, for Sunday night through Monday across the northern areas of Labrador. Big southerly push here, so we will warm up for Monday on the island into those teen temps, uh, but it won't last long as temperatures will drop back as we roll into Tuesday and we clear things out. So there's a look at your seven day trend. Uh, you can see where temps will be warmest Monday with those showers moving through on the island, single digits in behind and in Labrador, really keeping an eye on that Sunday night through Monday system with that snow potential. Well, let's turn our attention now to national and international news. Five years ago, Canadian man and his American wife were kidnapped in Afghanistan. Today, Joshua Boyle called his parents in Smiths Falls, Ontario, and told them they had been rescued. U.S. intelligence worked with the Pakistan military to free Boyle, his wife Caitlin Coleman, and their three children. The children were all born in captivity. The couple was abducted while traveling in Afghanistan and were being held by the Haganee Network, which has ties to the Taliban. The first lawsuit over that deadly Las Vegas attack claims the Mandalay Bay Hotel didn't do enough to stop gunman Stephen Paddock. Call the police. Someone's firing a gun up here. Someone's firing a rifle on the 32nd floor down the hallway. That newly released recording captures a hotel worker calling for help as Paddock fired inside the hotel. Police now say he shot hundreds of rounds before he targeted the outdoor concert. The new timeline leaves a six minute gap between Paddock's first shots and his attack that left 58 dead and 500 wounded. That raises questions over how long it took the hotel to respond and why police didn't get to Paddock's suite until he had ended his 10 minute long gun rampage. 
Well, the weather in Northern California is giving fire crews a bit of a break. Conditions are still dry with no rain in sight, but the dangerous winds forecasted for today were not as bad as expected. Still, 22 wildfires are burning and they're among the deadliest in California's history. Our house is gone, guys! Oh my God, our house is gone! It's Officials gone. say the fires have killed 23 people and hundreds are still missing. One man shot this dramatic video as he drove through an inferno. More images from a drone show the utter devastation in Sonoma and many other counties. Well, the Trudeau government has put to rest any talk of taxing employee discounts. Ottawa says the Canada Revenue Agency's controversial plan is now off the table. It does not reflect the, our plan as a government. This does not reflect our priorities and, and our values that we place on growing the middle class. On its website, the CRA had said that discounts employees get on items like food or merchandise should be included in their taxable income. The government says it never approved such a move in the first place. Have a look Whoa. at this. And the eyes perfectly match those beautiful fall colors. Uh, you'll never guess where this picture was taken. I'll give you a clue though. Route 510 in Labrador. The answer after the break. Welcome back once again. NASA scientists say a small asteroid passed close to Earth today. It was 42,000 kilometers over Antarctica just before 2 a.m. Eastern. That's about one-tenth the distance to the moon, a close brush in space terms. The rock is thought to be only 15 to 30 meters in size, and because of its size and speed, it would have been difficult to spot from your backyard. Also in Antarctica, a massive sea ice hole has opened up in an ice pack about the size of Lake Superior. Scientists are still trying to figure out why it's there. Even stranger is that it was first spotted by a satellite in the early 70s, and then it disappeared for four decades, only to reappear last year and again this year. Now, the going theory is that ocean currents are lifting warmer waters up to the surface, in effect, melting the ice. 
Interesting stuff there. One to keep an eye on. And uh, also, keeping. speaking of keeping an eye on, you think this uh, great horned owl was keeping an eye on our, our uh, viewer picture contributor today? I think so. <laughs> Taken in uh, Forto Bay, uh, just outside of the town of Forto. What a magnificent animal. Beautiful. Just gorgeous. I uh, love owls. I, I do too. I wonder how big it is. There's such a variety of owls. I, I don't know my owls, but some of them have very large wingspan and keep your pets inside. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> now Vernon has been lucky enough to spot this and another one that is hanging, they're hanging around together uh -huh. uh, for the last couple of months in Forto. Okay. So lucky you Vernon and thanks so much for sharing with us. That is a dandy. Thank you as well. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Have a great night. We'll be back here tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Good night.